Once more, he read the telegram that lay on the table, or rather his eyes went along the lines once again. He suddenly felt happy, although he knew that he was very tired. All day he had been relating the entire history of the country to the tourists and answering their multifarious questions. Now, it seemed that some life had returned to his flagging ambitions. He smiled. A tragedy like this should have made him weep, but none of it touched him at all. It felt as ordinary as his daily life. Getting up at dawn, hurriedly rinsing out his mouth, pulling on jacket and trousers, tying a knot in his tie, then smiling at strange faces as if he knew them well. A few days before, he met a friend, one of his best friends from his village, who had also come to the city and become trapped in some menial job. This friend knew about the tragic event and had uttered words of sympathy. I am very sorry, Krishna. I have my heartfelt sympathy. But this sympathy has not touched him at all. It had seemed meant for someone else. To observe convention, he had smiled nonetheless and simply say thank you. The telegram had been lying there for weeks. He always came home from the hotel in the middle of the night and he was always tired like this. He had been caught by a pair of blue eyes or immersed in western music. His eyes always shone when he looked at the telegram. Perhaps he had needed to receive it before he could really achieve what he aimed for. Now that he had received it, perhaps he was very happy. Very, very happy indeed. He had always tried to speak English since he was a child. He had dreamed in English and considered English his all. It had bought him a new value of wave in his happiness. Now he explained the culture and custom in his own way, how the Kumari was chosen, how Kumari was worshipped, what the horse festival was like. He thought of the foreigners staring straight at him, and of Judith and Jane's amazed by his words. His life was most enjoyable. Often, he dreamed of New York skyscrapers and awoke of his dream amazed by the goddess of the liberty there. Or else he would imagine lying beside the ocean, playing a tape of Nepali folk music. Sometimes he dreamed sentimentally, then he became practical again. For it was quite certain that one day Krishna would follow a tourist call far across the skies. Unfamiliar voices were calling him from the distant lands. Come to us just once, they seemed to be saying. We will be your guides. We will welcome you. We will love you. But then there was that telegram which he would rather not have received. It took him back to early times and forced him to think about things he would prefer not to consider. The person it considered had never meant much to him. He had never felt the need to pay much attention to her. He still lived in the city, just as he had 10 years before, trying to make his settling dreams grow. The telegram should have made him weep. But he didn't. He should have felt regret, but he didn't. He should have fasted for a while, but he didn't. The telegram should have affected him. It should have elicited some response. But the wires inside Krishna was strange. No current rang along them. Nothing ever touched him. No grief could shake his heart. 
he put it out of his mind and tried to sleep. He turned the radio on low and switched off the light. But sleep would not come. After that afternoon's tourist came before him, asking, How old is this piece of art? What's the importance of this? Is wood carving a new tradition? And so on and so on. He forgot them and thought about his lodging. He paid a high rent, but there were few facilities. If he got up too late, there was no water. If he kept his light on for too long, everyone compa- complained. All sorts of houses had been built on the empty fields in front. The open sky was a long way off. He thought he would move like to move someone else. Then he could invite that Miss Pandey from the travel service home for dinner. But the room he rented was bad and soon even that. Mundane wish dwindled away. Then he thought of the distant hills of his home he had not visited for many years. It would be good to go home every the same, he thought, to join in the dancing and dispel the emptiness of the city. He would gladly swap places with someone there, even if it were only for a few days. Or he could brag to the idle young folk. If you have no work, come with me, he could say. I will fix you up with a job. But as he thought of the hill country, that woman came into his mind again. That woman he did not want to define. He did not want to accept her or identity her. But the telegram had come and it was written. Your wife died yesterday. There could be no doubt about what it told him. Your wife died yesterday. It said your wife died yesterday. It would not allow him to sleep. He pressed a switch and the room lit up. He went to the table and read it again, forcing himself to concentrate. Your wife died again, it said. Your wife died. Your wife died. For weeks, he had slept there within sight of that message. But tonight, for some reasons, his mind was filled with desired and unwanted connections. Thoughts of the present and the past. All of them in discord. Why couldn't he sleep tonight? Why couldn't he make sense of it and weep? Having lived alone for so long in the country, had he become like a stone? Was he incapable of thought? Suddenly, angry with himself, he tore it to the shred and burst into tears. He cried, he cried, he knew not how long.